This is Rory Spiegel and Ryan Radecki, and this is the Annals of Emergency Medicine podcast. It is September 2020. Ryan's coming from the land of Druperidol and ketamine. How's it going out there? It's not too bad. Uh, it's still September here, so uh, even with the time difference, still September 2020. Is it true? Are you just bathing in ketamine and Druperidol like we like we thought you would be from all the articles we read about New Zealand and Australia? The pre-hospital system uses ketamine a fair bit. We don't use it a ton in the emergency department. Some patients have asked for it by name. They're like, well, I've used this other drug that I've had this kind of pain. It's called uh, <laughs> ketamine, I think. Droperidol, we do stock it in the emergency department, but our pharmacists also say, hey, why you don't you just use haloperidol instead of droperidol? And we kind of look at them and go, well, yeah, kind of, yes, but also no. <laughs> Let's just use droperidol because <laughs> that's what all the studies are all about, you know? <laughs> why not use the best studied medication for this project? So yeah, but it's definitely available. So more similar than different. It has its quirks, but yes, more similar than different. Everything has a different name. All the drugs have a different name. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I bet. Well, this month we we have a, basically we're coming to you with the geriatric edition of the Annals of Emergency Medicine. We got a lot on geriatrics and some interesting stuff on airway, and even you know we're going meta this month. We're going to do a podcast on podcasting a little bit. So why don't we just jump in? For a second there, I thought you were just saying it was a geriatric podcast because you and I are getting old. <laughs> yes, that, <laughs> that is unfortunately true. <laughs> but no, right. no, this is a geriatric podcast, despite our advancing age. All right, take it away. All right. Well, our first article is Identifying Injury Patterns Associated with Physical Elder Abuse, Analysis of Legal Adjuncticated Cases. And the lead author is Tony Rosen. Elderly abuse is a serious and difficult problem to identify in the emergency department. Much like child abuse, it is not always straightforward to distinguish from accidental trauma. These authors attempted to identify specific injury patterns that distinguish between accidental trauma and intentional abuse. And so they did a case control study where they identified 100 legally confirmed cases of elderly abuse and reviewed their legal and medical records. The cases underwent a fairly complex review process where they developed a novel taxonomy that uses three-step process to describe and classify visible acute injuries in geriatric victims. The control group, patients older than 60 presenting to their large academic medical center after a fall were prospectively enrolled from 7.30 in the morning to 11.30 in the evening. They then photographed the injuries and reviewed them using the same standardized protocols that they used in the case patients. The authors matched cases and controls using age, sex, and living in a community versus institution. Of the 100 successfully prosecuted cases of elder abuse, 78 had visible injuries resulting from abuse. They matched these 78 cases with 78 controls from the 578 patients they prospectively enrolled. The most common types of abuse-related injury were bruises, lacerations, and abrasions. Physical abuse victims were significantly more likely to have bruises, 78 versus 54%. Injuries to the maxofacial, dental, or neck region, 67 versus 28%. Injuries to the chest, abdomen, or back, 19 versus 4%. Abuse victims were less likely to have fractures, 8 versus 22%, or injuries to the lower extremities, 9 versus 41%. The authors try to identify specific injury patterns that were specific for geriatric abuse, and one of them they found was victims were more likely to have visible injuries in the maxillofacial, dental, or neck region without injuries to the upper or lower extremities. This occurred in 50% of victims and 8% of accidental trauma. So all in all, I thought this was a really well done case control study where the authors really tried to control for many of the biases that are typically present in studies like this. And they did identify some differences that were statistically significant between patients who had geriatric abuse versus accidental trauma. And while they were statistically significant, it's really unclear how clinical use they are. Bruising happened in 78% of geriatric abuse versus 54% of accidental trauma. Face or jaw injury, 67 versus 28%. And so, you know, there might be a statistical difference between these, but the difference is not enough to really use clinically. I mean, this happens enough times in accidental trauma that you can't use any of these determinants to actually say the patient ha was abused versus accidental trauma. So I think all in all, a really interesting thing. It points out some stuff that certainly has face validity. How we can use this clinically to differentiate is a little less clear. Yeah, I think that's exactly what the issue is with this is 
if you talk about trying to turn this into a scoring system or some sort of specific risk stratification instrument, you're going to have really poor specificity because you're just going to end up with a ton of false positives with the certain injury patterns that, you know, did occur in accidental trauma. And then likewise, it's going to not be very sensitive. It's not going to pick up every case of physical elder abuse. So it's, it's, it's something that informs your gestalt, but it's not something to rely upon solely for screening patients for elder abuse. Yeah. And you just kind of segue right into our next study because um, this one is they try to actually turn it into a decision based tool. So this is the multi center validation of emergency department based screening tool to identify elder abuse. And the lead author is Timothy Platt Mills. And so these authors sought to validate an ED or senior abuse identification or the ED senior AID tool. They performed a prospective observational study in three large emergency departments enrolling patients 65 or older after which a research assistant and administer the ED senior aid tool, which is a three-part evaluation consisting of a brief mini mental status exam, six to eight questions about dependency and elder abuse, and for some patients, a physical exam. If the research nurse suspected elderly abuse based on the screening tool, she then informed the emergency provider caring for the patient and made a report to the adult protective services. The reference standard or gold standard they used in the study to determine if a patient was abused was a panel consisting of an emergency physician with geriatric training, a geriatrician, an emergency nurse, a social worker, and an adult protective services social worker. And they examined the case at its completion. They enrolled a total of 916 patients. Of these, 33 or 3.6% screened positive for elder abuse with the ED senior aid tool. The panel identified 17 patients as of being positive cases of elder abuse. Six of these were positive by the screening tool and one was not. This gave the tool a sensitivity of 94%, a specificity of 84%, a positive predictive value of 58.5%, and a negative predictive value of 98.9%. So a couple things. I mean, these numbers appear pretty good. There are a few issues with the trial design that may have led to the result being biased. First, the patients who were screened positive had a different workup than those who were screened negatives. They underwent a structured social behavior evaluation. This obviously will bias the panel's later findings on elderly abuse. The authors try to control for this by administering the same exam to a randomly selected 10% of the negative patients, but this may not have adequately controlled for this bias. In addition, if patients screen positive, the treating team and protective service were notified. Again, this goes into their later screening or the, the case history later on, and it may bias the final determination of elder abuse. And both these issues would make the tool appear more accurate than it actually is. The panel reviewed all positive cases, but only 125 of the negative patients. One of these patients were deemed to be abused. How many more false negatives would have been identified if the whole cohort was reviewed? Again, this will make the tool appear to perform better than it otherwise would. Finally, like most decision tools, the author did not compare its use to unstructured clinical judgment, which may perform just as well. I mean, I think this comes down to, yes, here it is. It's a, it's a potentially valuable screening tool to identify patients at risk for elder abuse. We'll just put it back into the electronic health record with every other screening tool that the nurses have to use. The one for sepsis, the one for COVID, the one for alcohol use and abuse. There's so many screening tools that we could be applying in the emergency department. Um, it's nice that these people have, you know, sort of derived and validated this one to the extent that it is, uh, you know, validated as it is. You know, putting it into practice again at this level of specificity, I'm not sure it has a, it's, it's a good value for the use of time, the brief time we have with patients in the emergency department. Uh, social workers could maybe, if there, if there was something you could gather from the electronic health record that could be automatically abstracted a little bit more easily, potentially. It's a little hard to see how you take the leap from this to putting into practice with all the other responsibilities and administrative burden we already have in the emergency department, which isn't to say this isn't useful and valuable, but it's just one more sort of, you know, they call it, what's that song? The brick in the wall song. It's just one more brick in the wall. <laughs> I mean, I think our, our nursing colleagues would agree and thank you that they, you know, have been burdened with more and more screenings that they have to do at triage for every single patient. And before we add yet another one, we'd like to know if it's really beneficial and we're not quite there yet. Also, maybe there's a simpler tool, right? This is like a three-step process, including a mini mental exam, eight questions, and then a physical exam. Maybe, you know, it, it seemed like the highest yield was simply asking the patient if they were abused. <laughs> maybe a simpler process where you have a couple questions where you ask them may actually result in the same kind of outcome. 
Yeah. And but then again, if you're just going to look at this article, you could use it the same way we use a lot of decision instruments that we just don't really use that frequently in practice. You see what they ask in their assessment and it inc incorporate it into your gestalt. You know, the, the red flags, you know, the specific injury patterns that we talked about from the other article. The, you can do the same sort of thing with this if you're doing your, you know, as sort of an aside through your interview, if not specifically using this tool, you can incorporate this into your uh, geriatric assessment without actually applying the tool. Exactly. All right. Well, why don't we move on? All right. And since I've been talking about making tools and applying tools, uh, I've got a couple more geriatric tool-based articles to cover here. The next one is predicting hospital admission and prolonged length of stay in older adults in the emergency department, the pro-age scoring system. Lead author here is Pedro Curiati, and they are at the hospital Sierra Libanes and Sao Paulo. So what's that old rule, the age times 10% equals the probability of admission uh, maybe, <laughs> but that, that's kind of what they're looking at to some extent in these, uh, these two articles. This first one is a little bit different, though. It's a retrospective look back at 5,000 elderly patients aged greater than 70 who visited a single hospital in Brazil. These authors were interested in looking at an instrument to try and screen arrivals and predict admission, prolonged length of stay, and mortality. To do this, they took these 5,000 odd elderly patients but this specifically took only a excluded population in which they took out all the acuity. They took out the respiratory stress, the acute coronary syndrome, the strokes, etc., and only included the patients who were sort of triaged to their own little geriatric emergency department, which were clinically stable patients who could wait for their geriatric emergency department specialist to assess them. So it's not exactly a all-comers emergency department geriatric population for this tool. They took these 5,000 sort of uh, narrowly selected patients and split their sample into a two-thirds for a derivation and one-third validation, and then used backward stepwise logistic regression to find the final predictors for a model, the model that they call pro-age. From what they did, and then their model is that they basically took these 21 features that they thought would be most predictive to generate their model. They didn't actually sort of do a two-step process in which they used a large group of predictors and then for funneled it down to a smaller group of predictors. They had the idea of 21 best predictors to start with. And so, but anyways, after they did this stepwise logistic regression and they took their derivation and their validation cohorts, they ended up with uh, a final set of most predictive elements for hospitalization length of stay, and mortality that were gender. Uh, so male gender was more likely to die or be hospitalized. 90 plus years of age, uh, any previous hospitalizations within the six months, uh, any significant sort of weight loss, a mental status change, or an acute functional decline. So those being sort of the highest value predictors, they created a area under the receiver operating curve for their prediction instrument for hospital admission of 0 0.79. So this is moderately successful. But it has such massive generalizability limitations regarding the exact performance characteristics of this outside of this very specific setting, both in Brazil, this specific hospital in Brazil, and then, of course, this specific geriatric emergency department in Brazil with its own specific geriatric emergency department you know, support system and staff. So it's a little bit far from seeing a lot of clinical value in this quite yet. It's not a model trying to inform management decision. It only looks backwards and observes the decisions previously made. If I were to envision a role for it, potentially, if it were shown to be externally valid, would be sort of a score calculated, if possible, in the electronic health record, sort of invisibly, that would show up on an embed management dashboard somewhere to try and forecast future inpatient needs or forecast inpatient length of stay. But we're still quite a long way from that with this first step. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, even if you know this score and even if it's correct and it turns out to be externally valid, what do you do with the information? Does it mean, you know, every elderly male patient be, should be admitted, every elderly patient over 90 should be admitted? You know, the, the next question is, is, is admitting these patients actually going to make a clinical difference? And if so, what? So I, I don't think you can do much with this other than these are fairly reasonably or fairly expected predictors of a poorer outcome, right? If you're over 90, if you have weight loss and you have clinical deterioration, it's yes, you're far more likely to do worse over the next short-term period. And so while this might be true, I'm not exactly sure how we use it clinically to make decisions. 
Well, it's clearly, you know, a nurse puts in this screening tool <laughs> as they're getting ready to admit the patient. And then, like I said, it shows up on a case management dashboard somewhere. It shows up on a, some sort of somebody trying to figure out where this patient's going to go and how long they're going to stay there and what acute needs they might have. And, you know, this actually kind of segues into prediction rule number two that's being covered in this issue, which uh, is another article called Validation of the Clinical Frailty Scale for Prediction of 30-Day Mortality in the Emergency Department. Lead author here is Tobias Capelli, and they are at the University of Basel in Basel, Switzerland. So we just talked about predicting poor outcomes in Brazil, and now we're in Switzerland. And instead of pro-age, we have the clinical frailty scale. So the clinical frailty scale is not a new derivation. It's one of several scores, and this one actually comes from the Canadian Study of Health and Aging. It is derived and validated, however, using subjects living in institutions and the community as a tool for general practitioners and primary care physicians to try and stratify patients by degrees of vulnerability to predict downstream use, resource use or needs. So not an emergency department tool until now. This prospective study enrolls 2,393 patients aged 65 and older, and they don't restrict it to any specific subgroup of that, and they apply the frailty score. So unlike Brazil, including everybody, they actually do approach that mythical age equals admission rate. And at 63% admission rate for this cohort that's 65 and over, 55% of them died. And clinical frailty scores were, again, sort of moderately predictive of poor outcomes. The area under the receiver operating curve for clinical frailty, adjusted for age, sex, and medical versus surgical condition was 0.81. They compare this to the emergency severity index at triage, which, you know, sort of scales people in by acuity. And the area under the receiver operating curve for the ESI in their population was 0.74. So just simply looking at the, and again, this is just all in their population. So putting it all together. So yes, clinical frailty certainly has some predictive value of short-term outcomes, but Really, if you look at that ESI or area under the receiver operating curve, it's basically entirely confounded also by everything about why the patient is in the emergency department in the first place. So I, I can't see this having much value in the emergency department specifically again. It seems like it, again, <laughs> would be the domain of the inpatient arena using it, really as it was originally designed to help risk stratify patients for their short-term risk and vulnerability after they have been admitted to the hospital to see exactly what their risk for short-term and medium-term deterioration might be, additional downstream resource needs, because clinical frailty is going to predict probably likely six-month rehospitalization, 30-day rehospitalization, all those sorts of things. And I'm sure that there are case managers already using this or a similar tool to do precisely that. The big issues with all these kind of frailty scores is, is separating, you know, the meaningful difference that you can make downstream by identifying these patients early. A lot of what you're identifying in frailty scores is comorbidities and age that eventually starts to pay a price on patients. And whether that you can identify it in the emergency department and make some meaningful changes is really unclear. You know, it'd be interesting to use this stuff to kind of help you look at outcomes in certain disease processes like sepsis, you know, like, you know, if you have septic patients with increased frailty, they are more likely to do poorly than if you have septic patients who don't have high frailty scores and their acuity in the ED. So their acuity score might actually be the same, right? But, you know, a 35 year old with uh, an infected kidney stone who comes in incredibly sick and gets decompressed is going to be much, much better than a, you know, a 90 year old with a perf diverticulum, right? But yet their acuity score might look exactly the same. So it might help you compare outcomes from that standpoint, how it helps you in the ED. I, like you said, I'm not so sure. Yeah. And I think the problem is that these frailty scores are so collinear with just making a list of medical conditions that increase your risk for poor outcomes, diabetes, you know, malnutrition, low body weight sorts of things. These are all things that contribute to medical frailty. And there's probably some socioeconomic frailty issues that influence this as well. But the medical frailty stuff is so collinear with these scores. It just already comes sort of in your gestalt of this person's not going to do well unless we really attack them early. That's exactly what you're saying. The 35 year old with medical comorbidities versus the you know, could be a 35 year old with lots of medical comorbidities who's been chronically ill because he has genetic disease. You know, there's lots of things that make people frail. And they, there's so much collinearity with the medical disease that they already have that we're already incorporated into our decision making process and our assessment. Right. Yeah. And it's also like, you know, patients get admitted for, you know, for weight loss and failure to thrive. And the tool is going to look like, you know, 
weight loss and failure to thrive to predict submissions because it's one and the same. So it's hard, again, to really know what we're doing with this stuff other than it makes sense. All right. Well, that ends our geriatric edition of the podcast. We're going to move on to some toxicology. The clinical toxicology of 4-bromo-2-5-dimethoxyphenethylamine. <laughs> 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 Let's call the clinical toxicology of 4-bromo-2,5-dimethoxyphenethylamine, 2CV. <laughs> the severity of poisoning after exposure to low and moderate high doses. And essentially, Ryan's introducing it for me because I've brutalized that uh, title about five times. And the lead author is Johanna Nukteren von Lockhausen. So what is 2CB? Well, it's a psychoactive agent that came on the scene in the 1970s as an alternative to MDMA. And at low doses, it presents like a sympathomimetic, and at high doses, much more like a hallucinogenic. But despite being recreationally used since the 70s, there is very little data on its toxicity. So these authors conducted a prospective observational study on patients who reported 2CB use in whom the treating physician consulted the poison control center. After this initial consultation, telephone interviews were conducted with the treating physician and or the patient whenever possible hopefully within the first one to two days after initial consult with poison control, although they allowed for up to a week to obtain these interviews. They also collected leftover drug samples, urine samples, and blood samples whenever possible, and basically attract and try to figure out what kind of adverse events occur. So in a three-year period, 59 patients met their inclusion criteria. Follow-up was attained in 32 cases. Interviews were conducted with a medium of eight days after exposure. Predominantly, patients were male. 81% with a median age of 22. 2CB exposure occurred in inner cities as well as rural areas. 2CB exposure was mostly oral in 84%, but smoking or inhalation of vapors was reported in two cases and snorting in one case. 63% reported other drug use as well. Side effects are what one would expect from stimulant drugs, most commonly tachycardia, hypertension, palpitations, agitation, anxiety, and confusion. Less frequently, patients experience seizures, headaches, hyperthermia, and rhabdomyolysis. All of these more serious effects were more common in patients that reported high-dose ingestion versus low-dose ingestion. Of these patients, most were just shown from the ED, although there was some patients admitted and two required admission to the ICU, although all patients were discharged from the hospital within 24 hours of initial presentation. The biggest issue here is this is an examination of people who presented to the ED after ingesting this drug. How many patients took 2CB2 without any ill effects? How many had minor side effects that didn't present to the ED? How many had serious consequences and presented the easy dead or unconscious and the exposure was missed? In addition, the majority of these patients were exposed to multiple agents, which also fogs the clinical picture. Finally, drug urine and blood samples were only available in a minority of patients. So it is unclear how many of these patients actually were exposed to 2CB. So while I think we can use this data to get a basic idea of how patients present after taking 2CB, I wouldn't confidently use any of these numbers to represent true risk of exposure to it. Yeah, I mean, I think the key there is just the selection bias here that uh, colors exactly the picture you're getting of these patients. It's like cat bites. Cat bites always get infected as far as the emergency department's concerned, but you know, millions of people are getting bitten by their cats on a daily basis without coming to the emergency department people are being exposed to this drug or using it in clubs and not coming to the emergency department unless they have a severe toxic drone, which may or may not be confounded by other drugs they're taking at the same time, alcohol, whatever agents. So the good news is after all of this, it's just managed more or less like any other sort of excited delirium. Um, supportive care, there's no specific antidote. And the good news is, again, most of these people do well. Yep. And thankfully, it has a simplified name, so I don't have to say the, the long name over and over again. <laughs> 2CB. Yeah, just 2CB. All right. And now for something completely different, a different article from this issue called Patient and Surrogate Post-Enrollment Perspectives on Research Using the Exception from Informed Consent, an Integrated Survey. Lead author here is Victoria Cicilluna, and they are from the University of Michigan. And it's a quick one. And as a former chair of an institutional review board, I actually found this quite interesting. So you may have heard of the Established Status Epilepticus Treatment Trial, or ESSET, because it was a big deal published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it basically tested second-line agents for a status epilepticus. If you recall, it was basically a tie between the various options, levetiracetam, valproate, or phosphonatoin. 
whichever one is best stocked and most easily administered in the emergency department is a fine second line choice. But anyway, this study, however, is a follow-up study in which they were able to include 317 patients and surrogates of those enrolled in the original trial out of that 440 originally recruited, looking at their experience and opinions regarding the exception to informed consent. They tried to contact everybody, and it's mostly surrogate, not actually the patients enrolled, but like about 70-odd percent surrogates for either the children or adults who were enrolled in this trial while they were having a seizure. And they were given a very brief survey about their attitudes towards their inclusion in the trial or their family members' inclusion in the trial. Good news is most folks were basically okay with having been enrolled in the trial as a, a subject to exception to informed consent. 76% reported they were glad their family member was included. And this basically paired with the level of acceptance that researchers had also enrolled their patients while they were having a seizure without actually getting that informed consent. There was a little bit of reduced agreement regarding the lack of being able to ask permission, but it was still just less than a third of patients and surrogates enrolled who actually said it was who disagreed with the statement that it was okay to include them without asking permission first. And then there was a little qualitative portion where the folks enrolled suggested who in the community the research could have targeted with respect to that community consultation phase when they were scoping out the trial. And it was basically mostly patients and families who suffer seizures and go to the emergency department for their seizures. Overall, just a very nice little article and kind of reassuring that, uh, you know, in, in these exceptions to informed consent are generally well accepted by patients. The most interesting sort of trivia part, and it's, it's a little unreliable because the you know it's a small subset, it's a single study, uh, but minorities tended overall to be less receptive to this enrollment without informed consent. Something to think about if you're designing a similar sort of emergency consent study when you're designing your community consultation to try and find representatives of these of these minority communities that might be affected by your study and include them in your decision making to ensure that their needs and cultural values are respected. So an interesting article for people who are designing trials um, and it's a good look at you know how people respond to them. Yeah, I think your your last point is key there is that to make sure that the community informed consent is is representative of the patients you're actually going to be enrolling in the study. All right, well why don't we move on? So our next article is comparing emergency department first attempt intubation success with standard geometry and hyperangulated video laryngoscopes. And the lead author is Brian E. Driver. So, you know, most of our discussion about video laryngoscopy or VL is based off the debate whether video laryngoscopy versus direct laryngoscopy and which one is better. And, you know, despite multiple randomized control trials, we really haven't been able to survive that one is superior than the other. But throughout all this debate, we've kind of treated video laryngoscopy or VL as one kind of entity, where in reality, all VL is not created equal. There are hyperangulated video laryngoscopes. Most traditionally, this was the original glide scope, where the blade is has this very acute angle, and so you're unable to directly align the trachea with the oral cavity, and so you can't actually get a direct view. You have to look at the screen, and you know you'll see these great view of the cords, but it's awfully more difficult to pass the tube and you have to use one of those kind of hyperangulated stylets to actually get the tube around the curve that the blade has created. And then there's standard geometry video scopes. And this was traditionally the CMAC where the video scope is shaped much like a direct blade. And so there's a thought that you can actually use it as a direct blade and view the cords directly with your eyes and then use the video scope if needed. Now, this used to be kind of, you would have branding where, where the glide scope was hyperangulated and the CMAC was standard geometry. But over the years, they actually, both companies and, and other video laryngoscopes companies have made both types of blades. So now you, you talk about, you can have a hyperangulated or standard geometry glide scope, and you could have a hyperangulated or standard geometry CMAC, so on and so forth. So while there's a lot of theoretical benefits to one or the other, there's no real data suggesting whether a hyperangulated blade is better or a standard geometry blade is better when it comes to video laryngoscopy. And so these authors, looking at the National Emergency Airway Registry from 2016 to 2018, looked at patients 14 years or older who were orally intubated with either a standard geometry blade or a hyperangulated video blade on first attempt. Standard geometry video scopes included the CMAC Macintosh blades, as well as the GlideScope Titanium Macintosh blades. And uh, hyperangulated blades included the CMAC D blade or the GlideScope Hyperangulated blade. During the study period, 11,927 patients met their inclusion criteria for this analysis. 
This included 7,255, which are intubated with a standard geometry blade, and 4,672, which were intubated with a hyperangulated blade. So first off, that's surprising to me that more patients were intubated with a standard geometry video blade than a hyperangulated blade. I would have thought it was the other way around. Of the attempts, the standard geometry blades, 97.6% were performed with a CMAC, and 34 also used a bougie. Of the attempts with a hyperangulated blade, 87.8% were performed with a hyperangulated glide scope laryngoscopy, and the remainder, 11.7, were performed with a CMAC D blade. So while both companies now make hyperangulated and standard geometry blades, it seems at least in 2016 to 2018, the majority of hyperangulated intubations was still with the glide scope, and the majority of standard intubations was still with the CMAC. Patients who underwent intubation using a hyperangulated blade were more frequently trauma and a higher proportion of anticipated or confirmed difficult airway characteristics. An unadjusted analysis revealed that the standard geometry blade resulted in a higher first pass success, 91.9% versus 89.2%, so a 2.7% absolute difference. But after adjusting for COVID variants, the authors found no difference between the shape of the blade and first pass success. Patients with a hyperangulated group were more likely to have a grade one or two view, 94.1% versus 87.4%. But that's unsurprising, right? Because we know with hyperangular blades, you get a great view of the cords. The difficulty comes in passing the tube, where standard geometry blades, you don't have as such a good view of the cords, but if you can see them, it's much easier to pass the tube. It wasn't randomized, so there very well might be a reason one blade was chosen over the other, which might actually affect the results. Clearly, patients in the hyperangulated group had more markers of a difficult airway, and this might have actually encouraged the provider to use a hyperangulated blade, thinking it would give them a better view of the cords. In addition, since this is based off registry data, we can't be sure how clinicians use their standard geometry blades. Were they using them like a direct laryngoscope, or were they actually looking at the video? Nor can we tell why they failed when they did. Um, you know, again, it would be nice to see if the reason that the hyperangular blade failed was difficultly passing the tube, which was what we see in the, the VL versus DL studies. And whereas in the uh, standard geometry blade, if the reason was you just weren't getting a good view of the cords itself. You know, there's a lot of people, me included, have proclaimed the superiority of the standard geometry blade because of its theoretical advantages, mostly being that you can actually go DL and VL at the same time. So you can work in parallel rather than in series and rather than having to trade your blade out if it turns out you can't see with the video and have to go back to direct. But it's important to note that all these theoretical advantages aren't supported by any evidence. And certainly this study doesn't change that fact. I think the most we can take out of it, given these limitations, are the fact that more people, at least in large academic centers, are using standard geometry video laryngoscopy than, than vi and hyperangulated blades. And I think the final thing we should think about is these blades do have individual differences, and they both have advantages and disadvantages, and understanding what blade you're picking up and how to use it is an important thing before you go to intubate a patient. Yeah, I think the, the big limitation is just that it's a retrospective look. Physicians and providers are going to choose the correct blade for their correct situation. So if you're looking at success rates with specific blades, they're probably going to be related to the specific airway that they're being involved with. So if you really wanted to find out which one was a better blade, you'd have to randomize it. But again, it doesn't really matter. I think if we have the availability of both of them and you're trained in using an emergency airway, you're going to choose the right blade and the right technology and the right techniques for whatever airway you're presented with. Yeah, I mean, I think the last thing is like, this is clearly a representation of academic medical centers with, you know, a large portion using standard geometry video laryngoscopes and 35% and having a bougie on first pass like that. Yeah, you know, I'm sure the, the community is not the same as what we're seeing in this in this sample. Probably not. So yes, clearly not generalizable to every situation either. All right, so the last article, and this is the test. This is where we test you guys on what you've been listening to. <laughs> uh, the last article here from this issue is called The Effect of Interpolated Questions on Podcast Knowledge Acquisition and Retention, a Double-Blind Multicenter Randomized Controlled Trial. Uh, lead author here is Michael Weinstock, and they are at the Adena Emergency Medicine Residency. And clearly, this is a topic that's near and dear to our hearts for both Rory and myself. How much of this podcast are you actually going to recall? Be honest now. And actually, if, if you're even half paying attention to this part, and 
or even if you even listened this far to you, you glorious noble soul who are still listening to us right now, we salute you. All of Earth's metaphorical intellectual riches await you and your steadfast dedication to your craft. So the answer is you really just might retain something. So this study doesn't actually look at whether you retain or how much you retain from a podcast. It actually tries to inform how a podcast might be structured in order to improve a score on a test given after listening. One podcast that these, these authors created, the so-called Control Podcast, simply wove together a narrative of facts on hypertension. A second podcast, the Intervention Podcast, threw in what they call a few interpolated questions, basically a quick stop within the podcast to offer up a sort of stimulus question to try and prompt the listener to recall something they just heard while in the context of the podcast. And these uh, little interpolated questions thrown in to review and emphasize the specific teaching point were linked to specific questions in this test. So the, everybody in this test, uh, everybody who was in this study got this test on hypertension. And before getting even the podcast, people were given a test and they, they did terribly on it. There was like a 30% sort of success rate uh, or questions answered correctly on this test before anybody received a podcast. Then they, were, they had people listen to the control podcast, didn't have these call outs specifically to questions about hypertension. And they conducted this study where they gave a whole bunch of their residents a test on hypertension before even having listened to any podcasts. And they did terrible. They got 30% correct. Then they took another group of residents and had them listen to the control podcast. And they actually did a lot better after listening to the control podcast at 64%, but that wasn't actually the point of the study. Then they had another group of residents who listened to the intervention podcast, the one with the interpolated questions that were specific call outs to questions in the post test. And they did the best, 69% correct. And basically that huge difference, that huge 5% difference between 64 and 69% was the call out questions. Those five interpolated sort of questions that embedded in the podcast that were linked to five questions in the post test. The people who listened to the intervention podcast got those questions correct. And that basically made the entire effect size of the test difference. So you're saying if you give people the answer in the podcast, they will get it right in the test afterwards? The real issue here is that this is, what's the point? If the point is to record a podcast in which the people listening to the podcast are prompted with specific callouts to get questions correct on a post test, then yes, absolutely use this interpolated podcast, interpolated question, podcast knowledge acquisition sort of strategy. If your goal is to create people who you know, manifest the knowledge and the skills uh, at the bedside in a clinical, meaningful manner, this doesn't actually tell us that. So I know, from a medical education point of view, if you're prepping people for a specific you know, learning sort of intervention, you know, the boards or in-service or something where you already know the measurement instrument, then yes, that's how you would construct it. If you're just trying to create knowledge, uh, this, this is just a surrogate. But I think we could both agree that podcasting seemed to help. <laughs> it did yes it, it it made the ignorant into slightly competent yes good job podcasting that's that's the best we can do <laughs> yeah but i mean you already knew that you listener you already knew that that made you a better person so yes by listening to this you, you know that this podcast has made you a better person yeah and 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 you will now not be exposed to us giving you a bunch of test questions during the podcast but in seriousness, it's a tough gig, right? Like, how do you actually do this study and and actually show actually retained clinically useful knowledge? It's a much harder thing to do. So, I, yeah, I think given the limitations they have, this is a worthy attempt. I would have liked to have actually had the podcasts in the supplementary appendix rather than just the scripts of them, I, you know. I think in our digital age, that wouldn't have been a hard thing to do. So we could actually see the difference between the two. Given the authors and who the podcaster are, Rob Orban, I'm sure they're both fantastic, but it would have been nice to hear them. But yeah, otherwise, like you said, I mean, if, if it's not surprising that when you tell people the answers during the podcast to specific questions, they're going to get those questions right in the post-test. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could do a thing where you had a sim session and you had one group prep with a podcast before the sim session that had a specific, you know, set of things and a, another sort of sort of podcast with different cognitive hooks that emphasize specific things. And then you put them in, you know, a simulated stressful situation of some kind and, and decided if it worked or not. So it's possible to test it in a different way. Maybe they'll do that next round. 
That would be interesting because, yeah, I think the questions would be far less effective in that sense than in the other. But, you know, you could test to that example is where if you you did one where the actual sim, uh, the the sim uh, scenario was with outlined in one podcast versus the other and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, I, I think it's clear that you can teach to a test if you want. But the question is, does teaching to a test actually help clinicians and thus better outcomes for patients? This is like the foundational problem of education theory like everywhere. (laughs) You can teach to the test, but does that teach people the skills? Right. And therein lies the the difficulty in studying different educational techniques, because it's just so hard to actually, what is the gold standard for for improvement in, in education or improvement in knowledge? It's hard to find a good one. Yep. All right. So a great month. Interesting articles. Yeah. I think that the take home point uh, for the test is that podcasting is good. Podcasting with questions is no better. Maybe better. Maybe better. Podcasting with (laughs) questions if you have a test and you know the answers for the questions for the test, then maybe better. But yes. (laughs) Well, until until we have a test on the Annals of Emergency Medicine podcast, uh, we will we will not give you guys questions. So this was another great month. With any comments, questions, or concerns, we can be reached at annalsaudio at asep.org. Until next month, this was Rory Spiegel and Ryan Radecki, and this was the Annals of Emergency Medicine Podcast.